There were 21 Big 12 players taken in this year's 2020 NFL Draft. I'm Morgan Uber, and right now I am joined by ESPN college football analyst Dusty Dvorak. Dusty, in a time when the world is really starved for some sports, we saw the NFL Draft ratings were through the roof. What impressed you most about this year's NFL Draft? It was much needed, first and foremost. We all needed that, an escape from our everyday reality. And man, did it fulfill that void that sports uh, ha has left. And I thought that you know my company, ESPN, just did a phenomenal job with the, the production value of everything. So many moving pieces, live feeds from all over the country. It wasn't perfect, but man, I thought that they hit it out of the park in a time that we had to have it. And you said it, 55 million people tuned in over the three days by far shattering NFL draft records. And uh, I thought one of the things that I enjoyed the most was the human element, like getting inside these players' homes, around their families, to see that genuine joy on their faces. We all love to see that. And then also the funny stuff, right? I mean, to see Cliff Kingsbury chilling in his Arizona pad, to see Jerry Jones on his $250 million lot, yacht, even Bill Belichick hanging out in I don't know where he was. It looked like my grandmother's dining room. But I just thought all those things, all those human elements of this, general managers, coaches, everyone in between, I thought that was really cool. Even Roger Goodell and his dog and maybe take a little cat nap uh, on his uh, lazy boy. I thought all that made this such a unique and fantastic NFL draft. The wardrobes were a little different, too, at that. And to see the kids with some of these GMs and coaches in the room, it wasn't our typical war room shots that we're used to seeing year after year. But, Dusty, let's dive into some of these Big 12 draft selections. First, CeeDee Lamb. That was expected for him to be the first Big 12 prospect off the board to the Dallas Cowboys at number 17. The Cowboys, they already have two wide receivers with 1,000-plus yards and Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup. How do you see Lamb continuing to elevate this offense to a new level? Gives Dak and, and this offense another weapon, right? They did lose Randall Cobb, their slot, last season, so they're going to have to replace that. And I, I, as we've seen with CD, he can play all wide receiver positions. Even last year, 42% of his catches came from the slot. Half his touchdown seven came from the slot. So he's going to be able to step in right away, play that position, but also be able to sprinkle him in all throughout this offense. And really, it opens up things for Maury Cooper. It opens up things for Michael Gallup. You've got a 1,400-yard rusher behind Dak Prescott. Now, there's that other options in defenses. They can't double Amari, and you're probably going to get CD to get a uh, really ideal matchup situation. So uh, I, I think as CD fell, because as he was on mine and most people's boards, Cowboys do, he was their top wide receiver. They had him as a sixth overall player. So when he was there at 17, though wide receiver wasn't at the very top of their need list, he was such an excellent player. They had to add him, and I think it's going to make this Cowboys offense very diverse and unbelievably hard to defend. While the Cowboys were on the clock, seeing head coach Mike McCarthy and Jerry Jones so excited over there, you knew it was something good coming down the line for the Cowboys. Sticking with the Cowboys, this is a team with a very veteran defensive line. This past March, they signed Gerald McCoy, a former Sooner, and Don Terry Poe. You take both of those players, and they have 18 years of NFL experience. In the third round, they went after Oklahoma Sooner Neville Gallimore, what will Gallimore's youth really bring to this Dallas defensive line? Well, first of all, he's an excellent athlete, an up-the-field penetrator uh, with some real twitch and explosiveness. So the Cowboys have lacked that interior pass rush that they hope Neville Gallimore can provide. And I'll be intrigued to see exactly what this defense looks like under Mike Nolan. He's typically three, four principles, but when you look at Gerald McCoy, he's a one-gap defensive tackle much the same I see as Neville Gallimore. So my thought, the way they're going to utilize Neville up the field, penetrator, try to make those plays on the other side of the line of scrimmage. The great thing for Neville is exactly what you talked about, Morgan. The experience around him. And Gerald McCoy, coming from the same college at Oklahoma as Neville Gallimore, reached out to him immediately and let him know, I got you. I got your back. And, and GK, as he is rounding out his career, trying to finish strong, he is now going to look at Neville Gallimore as a guy to mentor, take underneath his wing, and show him exactly what it takes to be a successful defensive tackle at the NFL level. You don't always get that, Morgan, in an NFL locker room. A lot of times a guy gets drafted, and he's drafted to take someone's job. And you get guys that aren't going to be as willing 
to show you some of the tricks of the trade. Whereas this situation, very unique for Neville, and he's stepping into an ideal spot to learn what it takes to play the defensive tackle at a high level in the National Football League in a scheme that's going to allow him to get up the field and utilize his best assets. Switching gears to the Cowboys division rival, the Philadelphia Eagles in the first round also took a wide receiver in TCU's Jalen Rager. We've seen Rager stretch the field in his college days at TCU. How is the Eagles offense really going to benefit from his speed? Well, I just think that this guy is a freak athlete, right? 42 inch vertical. He ran 4-4 at Indy, but this is a 4-2 type of guy, Tyree Kill type of speed. And I, I look at Jalen Rager and what he brings, he brings the ability to stretch the field, as you referenced. I think he's also a guy who is very compact and tough to tackle. So underneath routes, uh, they want to get him the football yards after the catch. And he's also a guy that you can utilize in jet sweeps, in motions. He's an excellent with the ball in his hands and a tough guy to tackle. And let's not forget also as a junior, had a couple of punt returns for touchdowns. So he adds value as well on the special teams unit. So I look at any phase you look at, hand him the football, throw him the football, allow him to return punts. I think this is a guy uh, that the Eagles identified has elite athletic traits and they had to bring him in considering how devoid at wide receiver they were last season. Well, the guy throwing him the football will be the starting quarterback, Carson Wentz. However, he's been uh, bitten by the injury bug the past several years. In 2017, he missed six games. In 2018, he's missed seven games. And then the Eagles took Jalen Hurts there in the second round. How do you see Eagles head coach Doug Peterson utilizing Hurts? Well, look, if there's any team above above all else that know how valuable a backup quarterback is, it's the Philadelphia Eagles as they won a Super Bowl with their backup and Nick Foles. And here's the reality. Carson Wentz is a heck of a quarterback, but the, rea the, the truth is he's had injury problems and being able to stay on the field consistently has been problematic for Carson and for this offense. So uh, when Doug Peterson got there, they made a commitment to the backup quarterback spot. And we saw that in the second round with Jalen Hurts. So Press Taylor is going to be pressed with, uh, you know, continuing to develop Jalen Hurts as a passer down the field, keeping him within the pocket and, and continuing to allow him to mature at the quarterback spot. But what he adds instantly and why I think they took him in the second round is because he's not just going to be a backup quarterback. They're going to have a change of pace with him. I mean, I think there is going to be a package early, often, and all throughout the season, whether it's short yardage, goal line. I think we see two quarterback systems. The imagination of Doug Peterson, don't think he's going to have Jalen Hurts on his roster and not have a plan in place to where he can add value immediately for this offense. And what that does for a defensive staff trying to prepare for the Eagles, you have to spend uh, film room time. You have to spend practice field time for those specific packages, and the Eagles might not even use them. So that becomes a, a new weapon in Doug Peterson's arsenal for this Eagles football team. An NFL team that has been trying to build around its defense, the Los Angeles Chargers, they got a good linebacker in Kenneth Murray, an All-American from Oklahoma. With 42 consecutive starts as a Sooner, how will he add value immediately to the Chargers? Well, he fits perfectly with what Gus Bradley, defensive coordinator of the Chargers, does. And I think Ken is going to step in, play that will linebacker position. And at that spot in this defense, you need to be a sideline to sideline guy who's got speed, range, and the ability uh, to make plays all over the football field, especially in pass coverage. And that's what they think they have in Kenneth Murray. And you can tell how much value the Chargers placed on Kenneth because they traded a third round pick to get back in the first round to go get him. Uh, you know, head coach, general manager said they were blown away with his interviews. They think he can be a leader almost instantaneously, defensively. And as you look at the way Murray fits and the speed that he possesses, and let's not forget the Chiefs and all that speed are in that division. That's part of this pick, too. I look for Kenneth Murray to be a possible day one starter in this Gus Bradley uh, Chargers defense. Another Big 12 linebacker taken in the first round, Texas Tech, Jordan Brooks. The interesting thing, Seattle hasn't used a first round pick since 2011. What did the Seahawks see in Brooks that made them decide to use that first round pick? It was too good for Jordan Brooks. And how about the Big 12 with two linebackers in the first round? I thought that was big for the perception of Big 12 defenses. But Jordan Brooks, four-year starter, so productive, 
Uh, and I think that the Seahawks really coveted that toughness, that grittiness. And if you watch Jordan Brooks, he plays with passion. And what do we know uh, about Pete Carroll? He's a passionate coach. I think that they watch that tape, the productivity, the downhill nature in which Brooks plays, and the fact that he's a good tackler. He was the highest player on their board. They wanted all those intangibles and tangibles. And here's the funny part. They don't really need linebacker. They're kind of stacked there right now. Bobby Wagner, one of the best in the game, still there. K.J. Wright is outstanding. So Brooks isn't going to be pressed to step in and play right away. He'll be able to go in, learn from those guys, spell them, also come in on third down packages and be a contributor on special teams. But uh, so many things, I, I think, that led Seattle to bring in Jordan Brooks. Again, even though it's not a position of need, he's the type of football player they want in their organization. From the NFC West to the NFC North, Minnesota lost three cornerbacks this offseason. They were in desperate need to replace and find a good corner, and they did in TCU's Jeff Gladney taken in the first round. What are the Vikings getting in him in a physical corner? Tough, hard nose, fundamentally sound, right? I mean, it's like I told you before, uh, it's a Gary Patterson type of player, as we typically see coming out of TCU, but you mentioned it. Xavier Rhodes, he leaves and goes to Indianapolis. You've got to replace an all-pro corner, and Jeff Galavi's going to have a chance to step in, compete for that job with Mike Hughes and be a starter uh, immediately for Coach Zimmer there in Minnesota. And the competitive plays he makes on the football is why I think you could not overlook Jeff Gladney. 49 pass breakups in his four-year career at TCU. The guy just has a nose for the football and can make competitive plays on them. And then you mentioned the toughness. How about we find out now that that 448 that Jeff Gladney ran was on a torn meniscus? I mean, to gut it out, run that, still have that kind of speed, I think that was something that the Minnesota Vikings said, we want that kind of guy on our defense and in our locker room. One of Gladney's teammates, TCU tackle Lucas Niang, he is impressive in the pass protection. Dusty, these numbers are ridiculous. He's recorded 975 pass block snaps and zero sacks dating all the way back to 2017. Why is he the perfect fit to be protecting the Super Bowl MVP, Patrick Mahomes? Well, you know, because first of all, uh, he probably should have gone well before the third round. Remember, he played seven games his senior season and then had hip surgery. So he missed the latter half of the season. I think that's why we saw him slide to the third round. If he plays throughout the season, the Yang's probably in the conversation for a first, early second round type of pick. So I think there's some real value in there if he gets back to healthy and playing the same kind of football for Kansas City. Here's the thing. They've got bookends at tackle, right? I mean, Eric Fisher, former number one pick on one side, Mitchell Schwartz, one of the best right tackles in pro football on the other. They're under contract for two more years. So I don't think there's a pressing need now. He can learn behind those veterans and be ready to fill in if need be. Where I think you may see the Yang get on the field a lot sooner is at guard. And the Chiefs really believe that he's got that flexibility to be able to come down inside the power to move defensive tackles off the football. And I'd expect very early on in in fall camp, once they get going, we're going to see Niang continue to work at tackle, but really try to compete to get on the field early at that one of those guard spots. Of the other 13 Big 12 players that we haven't hit on, who impresses you? Who has the biggest upside in the NFL? Well, Morgan, I'm going to give you three. I know you want one, but I'm sorry. I got three that stick out to me. I, I'm a big fan of Ross Blacklock um, out of TCU. And the fact that he's going to get to stay close to where he grew up there in Houston, I think that he's going to have a chance to be an interior pass rusher at the next level that so many people covet. So I'm excited for him. Also, call me a homer, but I love defensive linemen. And James Lynch, for me, the productivity that I watched his last two years at Baylor, I think it's going to translate to the next level. His toughness, his physicality, and being able to shed blocks and make plays, I think is going to uh, allow him to be able to be productive at Minnesota. He got knocked because he's not the best athlete, didn't run the best 40, doesn't have the longest arm, but the guy is a football player, and that's going to show at the next level. And then finally, uh, probably the guy I put at the top, Denzel Mims. I was surprised that he fell as far as he did uh, all the way down to the New York Jets. I think the drops were a bit of an issue. When, when you look at uh, Denzel Mims and his size, his speed, the ability to stretch the field reminds me of a DK Metcalf that came out and went at 64 at the end of the second round to the Seattle Seahawks. He winds up having a fantastic rookie season, really helped Seattle, uh, you know, make their run into the playoffs and was a key cog for Russell Wilson. I see Denzel Mims potentially stepping into that kind of role for this Jets offense as a vertical threat down the field for Sam Darnold. 
Dusty, really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your expertise on so many of these Big 12 players. I also want to add some good news is finally starting to be heard. Oklahoma and Oklahoma State's presidents just the other day recently announced that they are planning to have students back on campus this fall, which is fantastic news for college athletics and the potential of a football season. No question. And look, none of us really know what's going to happen. I talked to a lot of people in college football circles, from athletic directors to head coaches uh, to even Bob Bowlesby, who I spoke with uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen, but when we see presidents at universities within the Big 12 and around the country say that they're planning on and they feel comfortable and confident that they're going to have kids on campus in the fall, that's the first step, Morgan, because to even talk about a college football season, you've got to have kids on campus. So we'll see. Obviously, the month of May is going to tell us a lot, but it does feel like there's some forward momentum, positive momentum to a potential season this upcoming fall. Dusty, I sure hope to be talking more football with you very soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Morgan.